Welcome to episode 19 of Mental Mastery, where we interview the world's greatest minds on what it takes to live an epic life. I'm your host, Max Weigand, and today I'm joined by the best-selling author and award-winning sports journalist, Matt Fitzgerald. As a leading running and triathlon coach and sp- certified sports nutritionist, Matt is the go-to guy for thousands of athletes who want to improve their performance, both mentally and physically. Matt is also author of the incredible book, How Bad Do You Want It? Mastering the Psychology of Mind Over Muscle, which has served me well in my own running career. So Matt, welcome to the show. Great to be with you. So excited to have you. So, so while reading your book, I was really fascinated, especially by how researching mental fitness helped you actually overcome your own mental struggles that you had as a high school runner um, later on. So can you give us a little background of how you went from this kind of classic head case runner in high school to become an expert in running and mental performance? Yep. Uh, so I, I got into running when I was fairly young, 11 years old, through my father, who uh, was running marathons back in the 1980s. Um, and so I ran through, um, what we call high school here and, uh, and, uh, I had a certain amount of physical talent for the sport. Um, but it, you know, as I, um, as I progressed to become one of the top runners in, in my home state, I discovered that I was not as mentally strong as I, fi- I was physically, you know, running is, it's a painful sport. Um, and, you know, racing just, it hurts. Um, and to, to kind of take the last step to become, you know, a state champion, um, I realized that I needed to be able to suffer more than I was willing to, um, in, in comparing myself to some of my peers, I saw that, um, they weren't necessarily more gifted than I was, but they were tougher than I was. And, um, it ended up kind of uh, spoiling the sport for me. And, and I, I had intended to run at university, but I didn't. Um, and I thought I would never run again I, when I quit at age, I guess, 17 and a half. Um, I thought I would never run again, but just, you know, uh, some ch- by chance, I ended up um, as a journalist writing about endurance sports. And that was the impetus for becoming an athlete again myself. And when that happened, you know, I had a, a feeling of kind of uh, unfulfilled potential. I felt like I had never become the athlete I thought. Stronger, so I was very intentional in the process of trying to uh, work on my work and develop my mind. Um, and it was it did not happen overnight. It wasn't like flipping a switch or taking a pill or anything like that. And I just had to sort of figure it out. I had to you know try different things. Um, but it really was an advantage of being a, a, an endurance sports journalist because it gave me access to. Um, the best champion endurance athletes, you know, Iron Ironman winners, uh, New York City Marathon winners, those types of athletes. So I was able to I was able to learn that they have struggles too, that they're not uh, that they're human, you know, that they also have doubts and, and fears and anxieties and um, you know they and, and mental obstacles of various sorts. Um, and it it in the book I call it sort of benign shaming. So. It, it made me. It made me realize I had no excuse, but it also inspired me. I, I felt like, well, you know, if if the race winners struggle with these things, then you know it's normal, and and, and it helped me. It wasn't the only ingredient in overcoming, uh, you know, my 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 mental weakness, but it, it certainly helped. Oh, I love it. It's such an important point that you're making is that like everyone's struggling with the same things, right? I mean, I've had several world champions now on the show and all of them said they had the same exact struggles that, that you and I and every other runner or person, whether it's in business or, or gender in life, we all have the same struggles. And I think oftentimes that we get so focused on our own problems, our own kind of small world that we forget that like even the best in the world struggle with the exact same things. It's just about how you respond to kind of techniques and strategies that you develop to to deal with them more effectively. So, so I love what you're saying here, but like you just kind of reached out to, to the best in the world and learn from them. So, so one thing that the probably main takeaway from book is that like performance is limited by the brain, not the body. Um, and you gave this incredible example of how, how when people get like those prosthetics arms for ar- arms, for example, they still get tired, even though their, their muscles aren't performing anything. Right. So why is right. it that the performance is limited by the brain? Yeah. So, you know, by definition, uh, an endurance sport is a sport where in in which you're never 
you're never working as hard as you possibly can, except maybe at the very end, you know? So you, you know, you, you, you execute an endurance race through pacing by intentionally, you know, not running as fast as you can until, you know, you're within sight of the finish line. Yeah. You know, you have to say something, you have to distribute your, your effort. Well, how does pacing work? It works through something that uh, scientists call perception of effort. Um, and perception of effort is just your, your sort of global sense of how hard you're working relative to your personal limit. So, you know, if you're going to run a marathon, for example, and you're 10 kilometers into a 42.2 kilometer race, if you're experienced, um, you have some sense of how hard you should be working at with 32.2 kilometers left to go. Um, and, and that, that is perception of effort. And that's really the direct, yes, you have physical limits, but you're not encountering those physical limits until, until you're done, uh, presumably. Um, so it's, you know, ev everything in endurance sports, it's not like, you know, powerlifting or, um, other sports that involve, you know, maximal efforts. Um, so, you know, perception of effort, it, it really is, uh, the limiter in endurance sports. Oh, for sure. It comes from the brain. And sorry, yeah. and it, it comes from the brain. So, you know, perception of effort, um, it, you might think it comes from feedback from the body, but you're actually, your, your, your sense of how hard you're working, uh, comes from how hard your brain is working to drive your muscles. And, and that's why even if you lose an arm through amputation or whatever, and you are fitted with a pr prosthesis and you use the prosthesis, it doesn't matter that you're not receiving nerve feedback from the arm back to your brain because your brain still has to work just as hard to make the pr prosthesis move. Um, so yeah, so that gets back to your, your example. Oh, that's so interesting. W one thing that served me really well in my own running is kind of breaking down my races into smaller parts. Um, would you say that that is kind of like an explanation or, or kind of kind of a strategy using this um, regulatory in anticipation where you kind of make it like break down the race into smaller parts so your brain doesn't have to be consumed of like, I have 10K to go, but only like 1K? Yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of little uh, tricks that runners and other endurance athletes use to, um, you know, to cope, uh, you know, those, that, that word coping is, uh, comes up again and again in my book because it, it actually comes from general psychology, but, you know, endurance psychology and psychology is just a specific example of general human psychology. I mean, you're still a human, you know, yeah. just because you're wearing a number and you're on a race course doesn't mean you're, 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 you know, not the same person. So there are certain, Uh, coping mechanisms that come up again and again simply because they're uh, effective. Uh, there are some that people need to be shown. They need to learn. Um, but there are many that tend to just uh, people find them naturally on, on their own. You don't have to, most runners, you don't have to teach them that it can be beneficial to break a long race down into smaller uh, parts. Uh, they'll just figure out that, um, it does make the race feel uh, less overwhelming. Um, and you see that in general psych psychology as well. You know, uh, people who are, for example, trying to lose weight will often, instead of, if they have a lot of weight to lose, it can be overwhelming to think about their long-term goal. So it, it can be effective for them to make incremental goals. Uh, just, uh, you know, so it's, yeah, so another example of general psychology as manifest in endurance sports. Oh, for sure. And you put it a really great way in, in the book when, when you said that kind of like you bring the whole person into athletics, right? Like we often think that like athletics and life are separate things, but it's the same, like you said, the same person that you bring into it, the same psychology and the same principles. So oftentimes I feel like like who you are as a person has so much of an impact on on even your success in sports because the same psychology, the same mindset, the same ability to suffer, the same self-esteem, all of these same things go into athletics. Right. Right. Yeah. In the book, I, I tell the story of uh, an American triathlete named Siri Lindley, um, who she she was, a you know, a lacrosse player, a field hockey player in, in uh, university and got into triathlon, triathlon as an adult and immediately was very successful with it. And but she became a, a choker in races. She was supposed to qualify for the 2000 Sydney Olympics. She was the best American triathlete at the time, but she failed. 
in the qualifying races, she, she fell apart mentally. Um, and she ended up discovering that her problem was insecurity, that, that um, she was too, uh, too much concerned about being perfect because uh, she didn't have, she didn't love herself. You know, she, she didn't have, she didn't believe she was a worthy human being. And that went back to issues from her childhood with her, her parents splitting up when she was young, feeling you know, neglected, feeling forgotten. Now, this is all deep personal stuff that goes back to early childhood. And probably the last thing she expected was that it would stop her from going to the Olympics as a triathlete. But to your point, she was the same person, excuse me, person like that insecurity was something that she needed to work on to, you know, become a happy individual. Um, and it just so happened that that uh, triathlon became the mechanism for her to, to do that work. The beautiful thing about it is that, you know, by doing that work, not only did she become a world champion the year after the Olympics she missed, but she also did grow and mature as a human being. So, you know, her, her triathlon career didn't last much longer. She had a lot of life ahead of her. And, you know, by doing that work, uh, it benefited her both as an athlete and as a human being. I love that point that you're making here that like athletics and especially running and endurance sports, I found actually makes you a better person. Uh, my, my, my old running coach in college, she used to say, I run in the morning, so I'm not an asshole throughout the day. Right. Like it just, <laughs> <laughs> but I always, always love that. Cause, Cause like, it just makes you a better person in general, right? Like, it releases those endorphins in the morning and you're just feeling better overall. You like improve your self-confidence, your self-worth. Right. So it's this incredible mechanism to really, dive deep into our own psychology and learn more about ourselves. Yeah, though I, I will say that um, it isn't automatic. You know, there's the potential there. It's sort of, you know, like, um, you know, going to college is an opportunity to, find, to, to gain an education. But if you don't go to class, if you don't read the books, yeah. you, you know, you're not going to get much out of it. And it's the same thing with endurance sports that, they provide a tremendous opportunity for growth, but not everyone takes full advantage of it. Um, so you, you have to, you, know, you have to do the work, you know, it, it, it takes, and it can be frightening, you know, when, you know, because when you, you know, when you have a difficult race and you find yourself, you know, mentally crumbling, um, so issues that you may hide from yourself or that just are hidden most of the time come to the surface and the question is, what do you do with those? You know, uh, some people just prefer to put it all back in, in hiding <laughs> and, and not work on the stuff. But, you know, yes. Um, but the people who really do, you know, become uh, better, better human beings, better men and women through sports are the people who who fully utilize the opportunity. Oh, for sure. So for those people that don't want to hide from that anymore, that actually want to, to get better and dive deeper, what are some, some of the first steps that you would suggest for people to really learn more about their own brain and then learn to master this, this ability to cope with, with pain? Um, step number one is uh, what I call intentionality, which simply means uh, making it an explicit goal or, or project. Um, you know, it's sort of like the idea that you have to name your fear before you can address your fear. Um, so I was actually just counseling a, a, a high school runner on the phone last night. Um, his, his father had read the same book and thought, you know, you should talk to this guy. Um, and that's exactly what I told him. He, he, you know, he's, he's one of those kids who he always wins the workouts and he never wins the races. Um, <laughs> we, we call them workout heroes. and. And so, you know, I told him, you know, step number one is just, is just telling yourself, I want to work on this. Like, this is a problem uh, because you're, you're not going to get anywhere if you just don't really prioritize, uh, you know, that, that kind of work. You, you know, if you just sort of vaguely hope it will get better, it's not going to get better. Um, so that, you know, for me, I went through a, a period where I stopped caring what my times were, what my finishing place was. All I cared about was after I finished the race, could I look back and say, did I leave it all out there? I judged myself by that standard only. Um, and so no matter what your specific hangup is, you know, being able to name it is the first step. It's not the only step. Then, then begins the work 
of um, you know, taking specific steps to solve it. And those can be highly varied. It, it, depends, it depends really on what your main issue is. Um, it also depends on your particular psychology, you know, like, so two, two athletes who maybe have the same problem can't solve it in, in the same way. Um, some need to be a little more gentle with themselves to take pressure off. Uh, for me, it was the opposite. I actually put more pressure on myself and challenged myself, um, to face it squarely. That worked for me. Um, but it, it, a, sometimes a little bit of trial and error is required. Um, step one is, is naming the issue and, and making it your explicit priority to address it. Oh, I love that. And I think that's so important that like, we don't like that you don't hide from it anymore, but you actually decide like, this is something that I actually work on, right? Because only like after you set that priority, can you actually like fix anything? So, so one, one thing I, I found really interesting um, in a book and, and in your work is, is you talk about visualization and, and how it's actually not enough to, to kind of help people prepare for the pain. Uh, why is that? Yeah, so the way I was first taught visualization, um, you know, I guess going back to the, the 90s, um, was you, know, you, you, you picture, you imagine yourself having the perfect race. Um, and this is exactly what Siri Lindley, uh, the triathlete I mentioned earlier, would do when she was training for the Olympic trials. Every night she would imagine having a perfect race. Um, and what ended up happening was um, she, uh, she got knocked uh, underwater by one of her fellow uh, racers during the race. And when she came up, she, she was behind everyone um, mm. and she panicked. Because when, you know, even though she had mentally rehearsed the race every night and thought she was prepared, she had never pictured anything going wrong. Uh, so when something actually did go wrong, she, she was not, you know, she was not ready for it. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the attitude that, you know, the mental state that you bring into a race can set you up for success or for failure. So... One one of the advantages of visualization is that it makes the unfamiliar more familiar because uh, there's nothing scarier than than the unknown. So it can be very helpful to take your mind through a race before you do the race, so that when you get there, you feel like there's nothing to be scared of. I've been here before. But in order for that to be effective, you have it has to be realistic. So you should um, you should be prepared for the race to be hard. Um, it, you want, you want to visualize success, but not easy success. Uh, so that's the proper way to use visualization. Lo love that. Yeah. And I, I think, um, what, one of the points that you also made is that like, it doesn't like help prepare you for the pain, right? Like the only way to actually get better at, at really embracing the pain is to actually go and and feel the pain, right. And like then cope with that pain in real time rather than just, thinking about it and I think that's such an important point because you always try to like avoid pain so actually right. going out and embracing it and and learning how to cope with it actually makes you better at it yeah though you know I I do want to make clear that when you even even in the uh in the anticipation of a race if you expect it to be painful you will be able to handle more pain than if you hope it's not painful there's I, in the book, I talk about, you know, studies showing this. Um, so because uh, perception of effort, which is that psychological limiter of endurance performance I, I mentioned earlier, it has two levels to it. One is how you feel. The other is how you feel about how you feel. So one is purely like sensory or perceptual. The second layer is emotional. Um, so what can happen is if you get in a race and you find that it hurts more than you expected, that will, uh, that will cause you to panic a little bit, and it will, it, will, it will make your emotions turn negative, and it will make the effort feel even harder. So if you go into a race saying, this is probably really going to suck. <laughs> you know, I believe I can succeed, but it's, you know, I'm going to have to turn myself inside out. That, it, it sounds a little bit negative, but it's actually positive because – then no matter how much the race hurts, it, it, it doesn't surprise you. Um, so, so that, you know, the anticipation matters a lot, but, but to your point, point, yes, you also have to, you know, 
physically expose yourself to high levels of discomfort. This is, this is part of the reason that um, athletes improve through experience is that it, it elevates their, their pain tolerance. There was a, a study done, interesting study done with um, maybe a, a pre-adolescent boys where they were asked to do two 800 meter runs. Um, and they were separated by enough time where they were fresh for both of them, but they didn't have enough time to train. Um, and what they found was that the boys ran faster in the second one than in the first. Now they weren't fitter because they hadn't trained. So that's not why they went faster. Also their pacing strategy was, was about the same too. So they didn't get faster simply by, uh, running a smarter race. Uh, the reason they got faster was that they realized the first one as, as painful as it was, didn't kill them. <laughs> so when they went, so they went into the second one, they realized, you know what, what I thought was my limit isn't actually my limit. And that gets back to your point where you have to go through it and see, you know what, I can actually, I can actually push a little harder than that. Even without being fitter, um, I can push harder. Oh, for sure. And I think it's such an important realization that like, no matter how painful it seems, it's just your brain telling you to stop, but it's not actually killing you, right? Like, it's not like your muscles actually giving up completely. It's not them being completely destroyed. It's just your brain telling you to slow down because it doesn't want to expand that much effort. And for me, especially in my own running, that's been such an important realization is that like, no matter how much it sucks, no matter how much it hurts, it's not necessarily that, that I'm dying. It's just that, that my brain is telling me to stop. So such an important realization I found. Yeah. You know, you know, what it really comes down to is, um, you know, when, when you're doing a race, you're constantly making a judgment, you know, what is the fastest pace I can sustain the rest of the way? Um, and part of that does have to do with, you know, how much pain can you tolerate? But part of it is cognitive. It's mathematics, you know, so you have to be, you have to be smart as well as tough, um, and, and, you know, because that, that, you know, that perception of effort uh, even though it is psychological, it's a real limiter, you know, like you can only handle so much pain. Um, yeah. You know, you can only tolerate so much perception of effort. So there is such a thing as self sabotaging your own race by accepting too high a level of discomfort too early in the race. You know, if you, if you feel like you're at your limit, 10 K from the finish of a marathon, guess what? You're going to fall apart, <laughs> you know? So yeah, you have to be, you have to give me a long one then. <laughs> yeah. You have to be smart and tough. Oh, uh, for sure. So, so, so outside of these things, what are some other tips that you can give to people that, that want to be mentally tough or doing races? Like what, what does self-talk look like ideally? Yeah. So, you know, self-talk is, um, you know, just the, you know, the, the conversation or, or dialogue you have within your own head. Um, and of course that's usually going on all the time, um, both inside and outside of sports, but what some of the, uh, the research has shown that the specific content of your self-talk, uh, during endurance competition can either enhance performance or diminish performance. So unsurprisingly, negative self-talk tends to harm performance, whereas positive self-talk tends to enhance it. Now, it, it's, um, it works in, in two directions. You know, if you're feeling lousy, it's natural to have a negative thought. You know, if you, if you get into a race and you think, Oh, I'm not having a good day. You know, I just, you know, I don't have, my legs are heavy or whatever. It's, it's impossible to feel that and then not have a negative thought about it. That's totally normal. Champions do it. What matters is what you do next. Um, so if you're sort of, you know, unskillful, you'll just allow those negative thoughts to happen and they'll just continue unchecked and they will harm your race. Um, if you're more skilled in self-talk, yes, you'll still have that same negative thought, but then you'll, you'll catch it. You, you'll realize, you know, it's called meta consciousness where you can, you can have a thought, but you can also think about the thoughts you're having. So it's like you're standing back from yourself, watching yourself think. And if you're able to catch those negative thoughts quickly, you can then, push them away or re replace them with something that's more useful that, that will help you. And it's not about denial. It's not about, you know, pretending you feel good. 
when you don't, you can't lie to yourself. It's positive self-talk is not effective if you're just lying to yourself. If, <laughs> if your leg hurts, you can't say my leg doesn't hurt. You know, it's, it's like when you're, when you're 10 K from the finish line and a spectator on the side says five K to go. That doesn't, that doesn't help you. You know, lie, <laughs> lies to- <laughs> at least when you, when you reach that point and you realize it's another seven to go. Right. Yes. <laughs> so lies don't help you, but you can, uh, psychologists call it reframing where you don't change the picture. You change your perspective uh, on the picture. Um, so there's usually something, there's some kind of positive spin or construction you can put on whatever is happening. So just to give you a specific example, you know, you might get, you know, just to go back to the marathon example, you might get, you know, into the late stages of a marathon and you're, you're really beginning to suffer and those doubts creep in. Uh, something you might tell yourself in that situation is, you know, yes, it's getting hard, but I've been here before. And it turned out okay. You know, you can remember a time, you know what, I, I felt exactly like this, you know, in Berlin uh, in, in 2016, and I had a PR anyway. So you just, you tell yourself, yes, it's getting, it's, it's getting hard, but I've been here before. And, and a, a thought like that can make all the difference. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So, so Matt, in your own running career, what has been the biggest challenge that you've had and how do you overcome it? It's uh, the, the same one I referred to. Well, there are probably two. Um, you know, one was that I, I had a low tolerance for perception of effort, really. I just, I, I, wasn't, a, I wasn't an athlete who choked under pressure. Um, it wasn't, you know, if I, was expe- if I went into a race, you know, expected to win it, um, I didn't, um, that didn't phase me. You know, it, it wasn't that, it was that I didn't like the pain. Um, mm. You know, it's like anything else. There's a spectrum. Some people have a very high tolerance for pain and, and perception of effort. Others, a low tolerance. Others are, are in between. And I needed to increase my, my tolerance for perception of effort. Um, and I can say it, it worked. You know, it's like, I'm, it really it is, I view it as an advantage now. I feel like I can actually handle more discomfort than almost any other runner I ever compete against now. Whereas I felt like my starting point was very far away from that. Um, So that was one challenge. The other challenge is that I am very injury prone. Uh, So, you know, I I get hurt easily. I get hurt often. Um, And that there's a big psychological component to that as well, you know, because when you have an overuse injury, it's not like it hurts all the time. You're not walking, you're not necessarily, if you have a, a, you know, an Achilles injury that prevents you from doing speed work, well, you're not, you're not, you're not in pain at, in bed and bed at night. You're not pain when you're sitting at your laptop doing work. So that's not the problem. The problem is you're miserable all the time. You're unhappy. You're, you're frustrated. So being injury prone actually has been another impetus for me to grow and develop, you know, psychologically as an athlete as well. Oh yeah, and, and just back to back to your mental toughness part for our listeners here. Matt has actually uh, finished Ironmans before, so so that's that's where you can get from from this kind of being this headcase in high school, right? To now finishing Ironmans, running marathons, all this crazy stuff. So so really, uh, congrats congrats to that to really mastering the the mental side of of running a triathlon. So I'm really curious. Do you have a favorite mantra or quote that you say to yourself, like before races or during races? Yeah, I, I certainly have some that I come back to. Um, but one thing I like to, when I'm asked this question, one thing I like to point out is that um, some of the, I call them lifelines. So, uh, um, you know, a lifeline is a, is a mantra that comes to you spontaneously in the heat of the moment. Um, so, you know, you might go into a race saying, oh, oh you know, um, my mantra for this race is, let it come to you. Don't force it. Let it come to you. So that that's a really good one. And but you might get you know well into the race, and then you know you find yourself sort of in in a situation you didn't necessarily expect to be in. And then that 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 planned mantra might be completely useless. Yeah. You know because that's why they call it performance. Because you you know rehearsal's fine, but you know. <laughs> If you, if you forget your lines on stage, you got to come up with something. <laughs> yeah. So, 
So what I often find is that the, uh, the mantras or whatever, you know, the self-talk, the words that help me make the best of, of a race, uh, I have to receive them. They have to come to me in the moment. So it's important for athletes to be, to be open to that. Um, um, for example, I'll tell you, like last year, I, um, I ran the Chicago Marathon and um, I was 46 years old. Um, I had, I had trained with a team of professional runners and this was my 41st or 42nd marathon. (laughs) My, my existing PR had been set eight years before. Um, so I I was in a situation where almost nobody is improving, you know, plenty of 46 year olds, uh, set PRs, but not 46 year olds who started running when they were 11, who ran the first marathon when they were 28 who'd run more than 40 marathons and whose PR was more than eight years old. That just doesn't yeah, happen. It doesn't. Like you, you, you know, it just doesn't. Um, but I, I felt like I had a chance to do it. You know, I, I'd had this unique opportunity to t- t- train with a team of professional runners. Um, wow. I was fit. I was old, but I was fit. And when I got to the last, uh, you know, 2K of that race, um, I was still on pace and it was starting to get hard. Um, and I told, I told myself, this is for a lifetime. This is your last chance. You are not going to get another chance. And, and that, that phrase, this is for a lifetime went through my head nonstop the last two K of the race. Um, I couldn't have gone into the race planning that, you know what I mean? It had to come to me. It made all the difference. So um, yeah, so it's nice to choose you know, to, to have sort of a, a greatest hits, you know, you know, power words or phrases that help you. But it's equally important to be um, responsive and adaptive and to uh, take what comes to you. You get very creative in crisis states. Your mind does. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, you know, those lifelines are, are, are key to making the best of a hard situation. Oh, for sure. I love, so, so did you end up PRing in that race? Yeah, by two minutes. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> what yeah. was the time? Uh, 2.39.30. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Love that. So um, w- one thing I wanted to add to, to what you were saying before is uh, what I found is, is also so important that, um, yes, yes, you have to wait for sometimes things come up spontaneously in a moment, but also practicing them in advance makes it so much easier for yes. you to actually use them in, in the race, right? Because like if like you've like you said like running a marathon right but you've never actually practiced those things you've never practiced the self-talk you you've never practiced those affirmations or whatever it's not just suddenly going to happen in the marathon like you have to practice it over and over again every single day so that way it comes natural when the day is right that that's true and it you know it's not just the um it's not just the specific uh, mantras that you practice, but it's also developing the habit of catching negative thoughts quickly. That's sure. really the key because, you know, like I said, the negative thoughts are going to happen. Um, but, but the real key um, is the faster you can realize you're having those thoughts and that they're not helpful and that you can step back from them and make another choice, the better. And that's really what you get good at through, uh, practicing self-talk in, in training you know that that sort of early catch oh for sure i love that so matt on the show we always love to celebrate failures do you have a favorite failing in your life <laughs> i i have a long long list <laughs> of failures um you know that's a long list <laughs> um, <laughs> anyone that jumps to mind yeah, well, I mean, I mean, one in, in my first uh, all, my first ultra marathon, it was a, a fifty mile race. Oh, wow. um, I um, I got forty nine miles into it and got lost. No I, way! I made a wrong turn. Suddenly, I look around and there's nobody. <laughs> and uh, you know, at that point, forty nine miles into a fifty mile race, you don't have much left. You know, oh, and no. you're also you're not really thinking straight. Uh, and uh, I just went, I felt like I was on drugs or something. Like I, 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 I just entered this, this, this sort of panicked. It, it was like I was lost in a desert somewhere yeah. with no water and no <laughs> cell phone. And, you know, it was just, a, it was the weirdest experience. Of course, I wasn't that far from where I needed to be. But it feels um, like in a moment, I bet. Yeah. 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 So, the, you know, the, the thing, 
the, the thing that I've always been counted as a blessing is because I'm a writer by profession, my failures are always useful in some way. Um, they, they can make good stories. They can make good lessons. So that actually really helps me a lot because as an athlete, I don't like to fail. But, but, but having that second role as a writer and, and a coach, um, I feel like, well, at least I can, there's some value in this. That, yeah, you know, it gives you a better perspective, me, right? <laughs> yes. If not for me, for others, you can have a good laugh at me getting lost one mile from the finish line of an ultra marathon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good story. So, so next time you yeah, got to make sure you get the. <laughs> Yeah, Funny unfortunately, things, it's yeah. not the first time I've gotten lost. Really? Uh, in, in race. Hopefully the last. Actually, though, no, no, I did get lost uh, after that in another another race. <laughs> it's, wow. just, it's just something I do. <laughs> it has, I've done it too. Uh, it, it was only 10K, but, but somehow I, I took the wrong turn and realized too late. But <laughs> If you has. do enough races, it's going to happen, yeah. Oh, for sure, for sure. That, that's why I love the track. <laughs> it's just... Yeah. <laughs> you know, all you can do is miscount it. The no, lap. actually, there was that Kenyan woman who made a long, wrong turn in the, the steeplechase at the... Uh, was it the Rio Olympics? Yeah. Oh, no way. Like, I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah, she went right past the first water jump. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> and had to come back. <laughs> that was on a track. <laughs> yeah, so anything can happen. Always, always get yes. prepared. <laughs> and you can also miscount laps on a track. Which oh, happens. that's true. That, that's terrible. That's terrible. If you have one minute to go when you're dead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that hasn't happened to me, luckily. <laughs> so, Matt, what, what do you think is the number one thing that holds athletes back from overcoming pain in, during races? The, well, you know, honestly, the number one thing is that is instinctively we don't like pain. You know, we we are resistant to pain. It's a survival mechanism. Like you, you know, you need you need that. Um, but you know, you know, having a natural aversion to pain can work against your goals as an athlete, obviously. Um, and and so one of the things I was trying to do in my book is to show people that. You know, sometimes if you if you don't know any better, better when you feel a level of of pain or discomfort that seems like a hard limit, knowing that it actually isn't can be very liberating. It's still hard, you yeah. know, to to push that limit back, but I, I, you know, just like consciously understanding that, as you said earlier, it's not, you're not dying. You know, it's, it's and it's not even a real limit. Um, it gives you the opportunity to to you know find ways, but if you don't know any better, if you if you think, well, that's just how it is, you know, when I feel I can't push any farther, I can't. Then probably that that limit will never change for you. Um, so yeah, that's that's crucial. Oh, uh, for sure. Well, one of the realizations I had in my own running is that like unless I drop like down at the finish line, like half dead and can move for an hour. I haven't actually reached my full potential in that race. So, so that since then has always been the kind of go-to standard is like, am I like basically lying on the ground for an hour and can't move? That's when <laughs> I made it. <laughs> like th those are the best races. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's a, it's a funny thing, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Like the more miserable I am after I finish, the better I feel about, uh, but you feel like a day later uh, about, about, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> for sure so matt before i ask my final question where can listeners connect with you online um so my personal website is matt fitzgerald.org um not dot com that's some other matt fitzgerald yeah. but uh yeah um I also have a website called 8020endurance.com. But yeah, the best place to start probably is uh, mattfitzgerald.org. Awesome. I'll put up the link for that as well. So final question, what does mental mastery mean to you? Yeah, uh, mental mastery is, um, you know, it's like any other, uh, any other form of mastery where you, you know your mind is a weapon or a tool or an advantage for you. So it's, um, it's having a strong mind that is capable in um, solving whatever kinds of problems that you want to solve with your mind, but also being aware of that. So, um, you know, masters know their masters. 
So it's, you know, it, it, you know, it has to have some substance to it, but a big part of mastery from my perspective is a consciousness, you know, of, of the power of your mind, you know, knowing like, you know, I can rely on my mind because so often we're in positions where we feel like our minds are against us or we're not in control of them. So mastery is feeling like, um, I am in control of my mind and it can do the things I need it to do to achieve my goals. Love that. Thanks so much.